chapter one part one of the doctor his wife and the clock this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by caroline the doctor his wife and the clock by anna catherine green chapter one part one on the seventeenth of july eighteen fifty one a tragedy of no little interest occurred in one of the residences of the colonnade in lafayette place mr hasbrook a well-known and highly respected citizen was attacked in his room by an unknown assailant and shot dead before assistance could reach him his murderer escaped and the problem offered to the police was how to identify this person who by some happy chance or by the exercise of the most remarkable forethought had left no traces behind him or any clue by which he could be followed the affair was given to a young man named ebenezer grice to investigate and the story as he tells it is this when some time after midnight i reached lafayette place i found the block lighted from end to end groups of excited men and women peered from the open doorways and mingled their shadows with those of the huge pillars which adorn the front of this picturesque block of dwellings the house in which the crime had been committed was near the centre of the row and long before i reached it i had learned from more than one source that the alarm was first given to the street by a woman's shriek and secondly by the shouts of an old man-servant who had appeared in a half-dressed condition at the window of mr hasbrook's room crying murder murder but when i had crossed the threshold i was astonished at the paucity of the facts to be gleaned from the inmates themselves the old servitor who was the first to talk had only this account of the crime to give the family which consisted of mr hasbrook his wife and three servants had retired for the night at the usual hour and under the usual auspices at eleven o'clock the lights were all extinguished and the whole household asleep with the possible exception of mr hasbrook himself who being a man of large business responsibilities was frequently troubled with insomnia suddenly mrs hasbrook woke with a start had she dreamt the words that were ringing in her ears or had they been actually uttered in her hearing they were short sharp words full of terror and menace and she had nearly satisfied herself that she had imagined them when there came from somewhere near the door a sound she neither understood nor could interpret but which filled her with inexplicable terror and made her afraid to breathe or even to stretch forth her hand towards her husband whom she supposed to be sleeping at her side at length another strange sound which she was sure was not due to her imagination drove her to make an attempt to rouse him when she was horrified to find that she was alone in the bed and her husband nowhere within reach filled now with something more than nervous apprehension she flung herself to the floor and tried to penetrate with frenzied glances the surrounding darkness but the blinds and shutters both having been carefully closed by mr hasbrook before retiring she found this impossible and she was about to sink in terror to the floor 
when she heard a low gasp on the other side of the room followed by the suppressed cry god what have i done the voice was a strange one but before the fear aroused by this fact could culminate in a shriek of dismay she caught the sound of retreating footsteps and eagerly listening she heard them descend the stairs and depart by the front door had she known what had occurred had there been no doubt in her mind as to what lay in the darkness on the other side of the room it is likely that at the noise caused by the closing front door she would have made at once for the balcony that opened out from the window before which she was standing and taken one look at the flying figure below but her uncertainty as to what lay hidden from her by the darkness chained her feet to the floor and there is no knowing when she would have moved if a carriage had not at that moment passed down astor place bringing with it a sense of companionship which broke the spell that held her and gave her strength to light the gas which was in ready reach of her hand as the sudden blaze illuminated the room revealing in a burst the old familiar walls and well-known pieces of furniture she felt for a moment as if released from some heavy nightmare and restored to the common experiences of life but in another instant her former dread returned and she found herself quaking at the prospect of passing around the foot of the bed into that part of the room which was as yet hidden from her eyes but the desperation which comes with great crises finally drove her from her retreat and creeping slowly forward she cast one glance at the floor before her when she found her worst fears realized by the sight of the dead body of her husband lying prone before the open doorway with a bullet hole in his forehead her first impulse was to shriek but by a powerful exercise of will she checked herself and ringing frantically for the servants who slept on the top floor of the house flew to the nearest window and endeavoured to open it but the shutters had been bolted so securely by mr hasbrook in his endeavour to shut out light and sound that by the time she had succeeded in unfastening them all trace of the flying murderer had vanished from the street sick with grief and terror she stepped back into the room just as the three frightened servants descended the stairs as they appeared in the open doorway she pointed at her husband's inanimate form and then as if suddenly realizing in its full force the calamity which had befallen her she threw up her arms and sank forward to the floor in a dead faint the two women rushed to her assistance but the old butler bounding over the bed sprang to the window and shrieked his alarm to the street in the interim that followed mrs hasbrook was revived and the master's body laid decently on the bed but no pursuit was made nor any inquiries started likely to assist me in establishing the identity of the assailant indeed every one both in the house and out seemed dazed by the unexpected catastrophe and as no one had any suspicions to offer as to the probable murderer i had a difficult task before me i began in the usual way by inspecting the scene of the murder i found nothing in the room or in the condition of the body itself 
which added a iota to the knowledge already obtained that mr hasbrook had been in bed that he had risen upon hearing a noise and that he had been shot before reaching the door were self-evident facts but there was nothing to guide me further the very simplicity of the circumstances caused a dearth of clues which made the difficulty of procedure as great as any i ever encountered my search through the hall and down the stairs elicited nothing and an investigation of the bolts and bars by which the house was secured assured me that the assassin had either entered by the front door or had already been secreted in the house when it was locked up for the night i shall have to trouble mrs hasbrook for a short interview i hereupon announced to the trembling old servitor who had followed me like a dog about the house he made no demur and in a few minutes i was ushered into the presence of the newly made widow who sat quite alone in a large chamber in the rear as i crossed the threshold she looked up and i encountered a good plain face without the shadow of guile in it madam said i i have not come to disturb you i will ask two or three questions only and then leave you to your grief i am told that some words came from the assassin before he delivered his fatal shot did you hear these distinctly enough to tell me what they were i was sound asleep said she and dreamt as i thought that a fierce strange voice cried somewhere to some one ah you did not expect me but i dare not say that these words were really uttered to my husband for he was not the man to call forth hate and only a man in the extremity of passion could address such an exclamation in such a tone as rings in my memory in connection with the fatal shot which woke me but that shot was not the work of a friend i argued if as these words seem to prove the assassin had some other motive than gain in his assault then your husband had an enemy though you never suspected it impossible was her steady reply uttered in the most convincing tone the man who shot him was a common burglar and frightened at having been betrayed into murder fled without looking for booty i am sure i heard him cry out in terror and remorse god what have i done was that before you left the side of the bed yes i did not move from my place till i heard the front door close i was paralyzed by my fear and dread are you in the habit of trusting to the security of a latch-lock only in the fastening of your front door at night i am told that the big key was not in the lock and that the bolt at the bottom of the door was not drawn the bolt at the bottom of the door is never drawn mr hasbrook was so good a man he never mistrusted any one that is why the big lock was not fastened the key not working well he took it some days ago to the locksmith and when the letter failed to return it he laughed and said he thought no one would ever think of meddling with his front door is there more than one night key to your house i now asked she shook her head and when did mr hasbrook last use his to-night when he came home from prayer meeting she answered and burst into tears her grief was so real and her loss so recent that i hesitated to afflict her by further questions so returning to the scene of the tragedy i stepped out upon the balcony which ran in front 
soft voices instantly struck my ears the neighbours on either side were grouped in front of their own windows and were exchanging the remarks natural under the circumstances i paused as in duty bound and listened but i heard nothing worth recording and would have instantly re-entered the house if i had not been impressed by the appearance of a very graceful woman who stood at my right she was clinging to her husband who was gazing at one of the pillars before him in a strange fixed way which astonished me till he attempted to move and then i saw that he was blind instantly i remembered that there lived in this row a blind doctor equally celebrated for his skill and for his uncommon personal attractions and greatly interested not only in his affliction but in the sympathy evinced for him by this young and affectionate wife i stood still till i heard her say in the soft and appealing tones of love come in constant you have heavy duties for to-morrow and you should get a few hours rest if possible he came from the shadow of the pillar and for one minute i saw his face with the lamplight shining full upon it it was as regular of feature as a sculptured adonis and it was as white sleep he repeated in the measured tones of deep but suppressed feelings sleep with murder on the other side of the wall and he stretched out his arms in a dazed way that insensibly accentuated the horror i myself felt of the crime which had so lately taken place in the room behind me she noting the movement took one of the groping hands in her own and drew him gently towards her this way she urged and guiding him into the house she closed the window and drew down the shades making the street seem darker by the loss of her exquisite presence this may seem a digression but i was at the time a young man of thirty and much under the dominion of woman's beauty i was therefore slow in leaving the balcony and persistent in my wish to learn something of this remarkable couple before leaving mr hasbrook's house the story told me was very simple dr zabriskie had not been born blind but had become so after a grievous illness which had stricken him down soon after he received his diploma instead of succumbing to an affliction which would have daunted most men he expressed his intention of practising his profession and soon became so successful in it that he found no difficulty in establishing himself in one of the best-paying quarters of the city indeed his intuition seemed to have developed in a remarkable degree after his loss of sight and he seldom if ever made a mistake in diagnosis considering this fact and the personal attractions which gave him distinction it was no wonder that he soon became a popular physician whose presence was a benefaction and whose word a law he had been engaged to be married at the time of his illness and when he learned what was likely to be its results had offered to release the young lady from all obligation to him but she would not be released and they were married this had taken place some five years previous to mr hasbrook's death three of which had been spent by them in lafayette place so much for the beautiful woman next door there being absolutely no clue to the assailant of mr hasbrook i naturally looked forward to the inquest for some evidence upon which to work 
but there seemed to be no underlying facts to this tragedy the most careful study into the habits and conduct of the deceased brought nothing to light save his general beneficence and rectitude nor was there in his history or in that of his wife any secret or hidden obligation calculated to provoke any such act of revenge as murder mrs hasbrook's surmise that the intruder was simply a burglar and that she had rather imagined than heard the words that pointed to the shooting as a deed of vengeance soon gained general credence but though the police worked long and arduously in this new direction their efforts were without fruit and the case bade fair to remain an unsolvable mystery but the deeper the mystery the more persistently does my mind cling to it and some five months after the matter had been delegated to oblivion i found myself starting suddenly from sleep with these words ringing in my ears who uttered the scream that gave the first alarm of mr hasbrook's violent death i was in such a state of excitement that the perspiration stood out on my forehead mrs hasbrook's story of the occurrence returned to me and i remembered as distinctly as if she were then speaking that she had expressly stated that she did not scream when confronted by the sight of her husband's dead body but some one had screamed and that very loudly who was it then one of the maids startled by the sudden summons from below or some one else some one involuntarily witness of the crime whose testimony had been suppressed at the inquest by fear or influence the possibility of having come upon a clue even at this late day so fired my ambition that i took the first opportunity of revisiting lafayette place choosing such persons as i thought most open to my questions i learned that there were many who could testify to having heard a woman's shrill scream on that memorable night just prior to the alarm given by old cyrus but no one who could tell from whose lips it had come one fact however was immediately settled it had not been the result of the servant women's fears both of the girls were positive that they had uttered no sound nor had they themselves heard any till cyrus rushed to the window with his wild cries as the scream by whomever given was uttered before they descended the stairs i was convinced by these assurances that it had issued from one of the front windows and not from the rear of the house where their own rooms lay could it be that it had sprung from the adjoining dwelling and that my thoughts went no further but i made up my mind to visit the doctor's house at once it took some courage to do this for the doctor's wife had attended the inquest and her beauty seen in broad daylight had worn such an aspect of mingled sweetness and dignity that i hesitated to encounter it under any circumstances likely to disturb its pure serenity but a clue once grasped cannot be lightly set aside by a true detective and it would have taken more than a woman's frown to stop me at this point so i rang dr sabrisky's bell End of chapter one part one chapter one part two of the doctor 
his wife and the clock by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter one part two i am seventy years old now and am no longer daunted by the charms of a beautiful woman but i confess that when i found myself in the fine reception parlour on the first floor i experienced no little trepidation at the prospect of the interview which awaited me but as soon as the fine commanding form of the doctor's wife crossed the threshold i recovered my senses and surveyed her with as direct a gaze as my position allowed for her aspect bespoke a degree of emotion that astonished me and even before i spoke i perceived her to be trembling though she was a woman of no little natural dignity and self-possession i seem to know your face she said advancing courteously towards me but your name and here she glanced at the card she held in her hand is totally unfamiliar to me i think you saw me some eighteen months ago said i i am the detective who gave testimony at the inquest which was held over the remains of mr hasbrook i had not meant to startle her but at this introduction of myself i saw her naturally pale cheek turn paler and her fine eyes which had been fixed curiously upon me gradually sink to the floor great heaven thought i what is this i have stumbled upon i do not understand what business you can have with me she presently remarked with a show of gentle indifference that did not in the least deceive me i do not wonder i rejoined the crime which took place next door is almost forgotten by the community and even if it were not i am sure you would find it difficult to conjecture the nature of the question i have to put to you i am surprised she began rising in her involuntary emotion and thereby compelling me to rise also how can you have any question to ask me on this subject yet if you have she continued with a rapid change of manner that touched my heart in spite of myself i shall of course do my best to answer you there are women whose sweetest tones and most charming smiles only serve to awaken distrust in men of my calling but mrs Sabriskie was not of this number her face was beautiful but it was also candid in its expression and beneath the agitation which palpably disturbed her i was sure there lurked nothing either wicked or false yet i held fast by the clue which i had grasped as it were in the dark and without knowing whither i was tending much less whither i was leading her i proceeded to say the question which i presume to put to you as the next-door neighbour of mr hasbrook is this who was the woman who screamed out so loudly that the whole neighbourhood heard her on the night of that gentleman's assassination the gasp she gave answered my question in a way she little realised and struck as i was by the impalpable links that had led me to the threshold of this hitherto unsolvable mystery i was about to press my advantage and ask another question when she quickly started forward and laid her hand on my lips astonished i looked at her inquiringly but her head was turned aside and her eyes fixed upon the door showed the greatest anxiety instantly i realized what she feared 
her husband was entering the house and she dreaded lest his ears should catch a word of our conversation not knowing what was in her mind and unable to realize the importance of the moment to her i yet listened to the advance of her blind husband with an almost painful interest would he enter the room where we were or would he pass immediately to his office in the rear she seemed to wonder too and almost held her breath as he neared the door paused and stood in the open doorway with his ear turned toward us as for myself i remained perfectly still gazing at his face in mingled surprise and apprehension for besides its beauty which was of a marked order as i have already observed it had a touching expression which irresistibly aroused both pity and interest in the spectator this may have been the result of his affliction or it may have sprung from some deeper cause but whatever its source this look in his face produced a strong impression upon me and interested me at once in his personality would he enter or would he pass on her look of silent appeal showed me in which direction her wishes lay but while i answered her gaze by complete silence i was conscious in some indistinct way that the business i had undertaken would be better furthered by his entrance the blind have been often said to possess a sixth sense in place of the other they have lost though i am sure we made no noise i soon perceived that he was aware of our presence stepping hastily forward he said in the high and vibrating tone of restrained passion helen are you here for a moment i thought she did not mean to answer but knowing doubtless from experience the impossibility of deceiving him she answered with a cheerful assent dropping her hand as she did so from before my lips he heard the slight rustle which accompanied the movement and a look i found it hard to comprehend flashed over his features altering his expression so completely that he seemed another man you have some one with you he declared advancing another step but with none of the uncertainty which usually accompanies the movements of the blind some dear friend he went on with an almost sarcastic emphasis and a forced smile that had little gaiety in it the agitated and distressed blush which answered him could have but one interpretation he suspected that her hand had been clasped in mine and she perceived his thought and knew that i perceived it also drawing herself up she moved towards him saying in a sweet womanly tone that to me spoke volumes it is no friend constant not even an acquaintance the person whom i now present to you is an agent from the police he is here upon a trivial errand which will soon be finished when i will join you in your office i knew she was but taking a choice between two evils that she would have saved her husband the knowledge of a detective's presence in the house if her self-respect would have allowed it but neither she nor i anticipated the effect which this presentation produced upon him a police officer he repeated staring with his sightless eyes as if in his eagerness to see he half hoped his lost sense would return he can have no trivial errand here he has been sent by god himself to let me speak for you 
hastily interposed his wife springing to his side and clasping his arm with a fervour that was equally expressive of appeal and command then turning to me she explained since mr hasbrook's unaccountable death my husband has been labouring under an hallucination which i have only to mention for you to recognise its perfect absurdity he thinks oh do not look like that constant you know it is an hallucination which must vanish the moment we drag it into broad daylight that he he the best man in the world was himself the assailant of mr hasbrook good god i say nothing of the impossibility of this being so she went on in a fervour of expostulation he is blind and could not have delivered such a shot even if he had desired to besides he had no weapon but the inconsistency of the thing speaks for itself and should assure him that his mind is unbalanced and that he is merely suffering from a shock that was greater than we realized he is a physician and has had many such instances in his own practice why he was very much attached to mr hasbrook they were the best of friends and though he insists that he killed him he cannot give any reason for the deed at these words the doctor's face grew stern and he spoke like an automaton repeating some fearful lesson i killed him i went to his room and deliberately shot him i had nothing against him and my remorse is extreme arrest me and let me pay the penalty of my crime it is the only way in which i can obtain peace shocked beyond all power of self-control by this repetition of what she evidently considered the unhappy ravings of a madman she let go his arm and turned upon me in frenzy convince him she cried convince him by your questions that he never could have done this fearful thing i was labouring under great excitement myself for i felt my youth against me in a matter of such tragic consequence besides i agreed with her that he was in a distempered state of mind and i hardly knew how to deal with one so fixed in his hallucination and with so much intelligence to support it but the emergency was great for he was holding out his wrists in the evident expectation of my taking him into instant custody and the sight was killing his wife who had sunk on the floor between us in terror and anguish you say you killed mr hasbrook i began where did you get your pistol and what did you do with it after you left his house my husband had no pistol never had any pistol put in mrs zabriskie with vehement assertion if i had seen him with such a weapon i threw it away when i left the house i cast it as far from me as possible for i was frightened at what i had done horribly frightened no pistol was ever found i answered with a smile forgetting for the moment that he could not see if such an instrument had been found in the street after a murder of such consequence it certainly would have been brought to the police you forget that a good pistol is valuable property he went on stolidly some one came along before the general alarm was given and seeing such a treasure lying on the sidewalk picked it up and carried it off not being an honest man he preferred to keep it to drawing the attention of the police upon himself huh perhaps said i but when did you get it surely you can tell where you procured such a weapon if as your wife intimates you did not own one i bought it that self-same night of a friend 
a friend whom i will not name since he resides no longer in this country i he paused intense passion was in his face he turned towards his wife and a low cry escaped him which made her look up in fear i do not wish to go into any particulars said he god forsook me and i committed a horrible crime when i am punished perhaps peace will return to me and happiness to her i would not wish her to suffer too long or too bitterly for my sin constant what love was in the cry and what despair it seemed to move him and turn his thoughts for a moment into a different channel poor child he murmured stretching out his hands by an irresistible impulse towards her but the change was but momentary and he was soon again the stern and determined self-accuser are you going to take me before a magistrate he asked if so i have a few duties to perform which you are welcome to witness i have no warrant i said besides i am scarcely the one to take such a responsibility upon myself if however you persist in your declaration i will communicate with my superiors who will take such actions as they think best that will be more satisfactory to me said he for though i have many times contemplated giving myself up to the authorities i have still much to do before i can leave my home and practice without injury to others good day when you want me you will find me here he was gone and the poor young wife was left crouching on the floor alone pitying her shame and terror i ventured to remark that it was not an uncommon thing for a man to confess to a crime he had never committed and assured her that the matter would be inquired into very carefully before any attempt was made upon his liberty she thanked me and slowly rising tried to regain her equanimity but the manner as well as the matter of her husband's self-condemnation was too overwhelming in its nature for her to recover readily from her emotions i have long dreaded this she acknowledged for months i have foreseen that he would make some rash communication or insane avowal if i had dared i would have consulted some physician about this hallucination of his but he was so sane on other points that i hesitated to give my dreadful secret to the world i kept hoping that time and his daily pursuits would have their effect and restore him to himself but his illusion grows and now i fear that nothing will ever convince him that he did not commit the deed of which he accuses himself if he were not blind i would have more hope but the blind have so much time for brooding i think he had better be indulged in his fancies for the present i ventured if he is labouring under an illusion it might be dangerous to cross him if she echoed in an indescribable tone of amazement and dread can you for a moment harbour the idea that he has spoken the truth madam i returned with something of the cynicism of my later years what caused you to give such an unearthly scream just before this murder was made known to the neighbourhood she stared paled and finally began to tremble not as i now believe at the insinuation latent in my words but at the doubts which my question aroused in her own breast did i she asked then with a great burst of candour which seemed inseparable from her nature she continued 
why do i try to mislead you or deceive myself i did give a shriek just before the alarm was raised next door but it was not from any knowledge i had of a crime having been committed but because i unexpectedly saw before me my husband whom i supposed to be on his way to poughkeepsie he was looking very pale and strange and for a moment i thought i was beholding his ghost but he soon explained his appearance by saying that he had fallen from the train and had been only saved by a miracle from being dismembered and i was just bemoaning his mishap and trying to calm him and myself when that terrible shout was heard next door of murder murder coming so soon after the shock he had himself experienced it quite unnerved him and i think we can date his mental disturbance from that moment for he began almost immediately to take a morbid interest in the affair next door though it was weeks if not months before he let a word fall of the nature of those you have just heard indeed it was not till i repeated to him some of the expressions he was continually letting fall in his sleep that he commenced to accuse himself of crime and talk of retribution you say that your husband frightened you on that night by appearing suddenly at the door when you thought him on his way to poughkeepsie is dr zabriskie in the habit of thus going and coming alone at an hour so late as this must have been you forget that to the blind night is less full of perils than the day often and often has my husband found his way to his patients houses alone after midnight but on this especial evening he had harry with him harry was his driver and always accompanied him when he went any distance well then said i all we have to do is to summon harry and hear what he has to say concerning this affair he surely will know whether or not his master went into the house next door harry has left us she said dr zabriskie has another driver now besides i have nothing to conceal from you harry was not with him when he returned to the house that evening or the doctor would not have been without his portmanteau till the next day something i have never known what caused them to separate and that is why i have no answer to give the doctor when he accuses himself of committing a deed on that night which is wholly out of keeping with every other act of his life and have you never questioned harry why they separated and why he allowed his master to come home alone after the shock he had received at the station i did not know there was any reason for doing so till long after he left us and when did he leave you that i do not remember a few weeks or possibly a few days after that dreadful night and where is he now ah that i have not the least means of knowing but she suddenly cried what do you want of harry if he did not follow dr zabriskie to his own door he could tell us nothing that would convince my husband that he is labouring under an illusion but he might tell us something which would convince us that dr zabriskie was not himself after the accident that he hush came from her lips in imperious tones i will not believe that he shot mr hasbrook even if you prove him to have been insane at the time how could he my husband is blind it would take a man of very keen sight to force himself into a house that was closed for the night and kill a man in the dark at one shot rather cried a voice from the doorway it is only a blind man who could do this those who trust to eyesight 
must be able to catch some glimpse of the mark they aim at and this room as i have been told was without a glimmer of light but the blind trust to sound and as mr hasbrook spoke oh burst from the horrified wife is there no one to stop him when he speaks like that End of chapter one part two chapter two part one of the doctor his wife and the clock by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter two part one when i related to my superiors the details of the foregoing interview two of them coincided with the wife in thinking that dr zabriskie was in an irresponsible condition of mind which made any statement of his questionable but the third seemed disposed to argue the matter and casting me an inquiring look seemed to ask what my opinion was on the subject answering him as if he had spoken i gave my conclusion as follows that whether insane or not dr zabriskie had fired the shot which terminated mr hasbrook's life it was the inspector's own idea but it was not shared in by the others one of whom had known the doctor for years accordingly they compromised by postponing all opinion till they had themselves interrogated the doctor and i was detailed to bring him before them the next afternoon he came without reluctance his wife accompanying him in the short time which elapsed between their leaving lafayette place and entering headquarters i embraced the opportunity of observing them and i found the study equally exciting and interesting his face was calm but hopeless and his eye which should have shown a wild glimmer if there was truth in his wife's hypothesis was dark and unfathomable but neither frenzied nor uncertain he spake but once and listened to nothing though now and then his wife moved as if to attract his attention and once even stole her hand towards his in the tender hope that he would feel its approach and accept her sympathy but he was deaf as well as blind and sat wrapped up in thoughts which she i know would have given worlds to penetrate her countenance was not without its mystery also she showed in every lineament passionate concern and misery and a deep tenderness from which the element of fear was not absent but she as well as he betrayed that some misunderstanding deeper than any i had previously suspected drew its intangible veil between them and made the near proximity in which they sat at once a heart-piercing delight and an unspeakable pain what was this misunderstanding and what was the character of the fear that modified her every look of love in his direction her perfect indifference to my presence proved that it was not connected with the position in which he had put himself towards the police by his voluntary confession of crime nor could i thus interpret the expression of frantic question which now and then contracted her features as she raised her eyes towards his sightless orbs and strove to read in his firm-set lips the meaning of those assertions she could only ascribe to a loss of reason the stopping of the carriage seemed to awaken both from thoughts that separated rather than united them he turned his face in her direction and she 
stretching forth her hand prepared to lead him from the carriage without any of that display of timidity which had been previously evident in her manner as his guide she seemed to fear nothing as his lover everything there is another and deeper tragedy underlying the outward and obvious one was my inward conclusion as i followed them into the presence of the gentlemen awaiting them dr zabriskie's appearance was a shock to those who knew him so was his manner which was calm straightforward and quietly determined i shot mr hasbrook was his steady affirmation given without any show of frenzy or desperation if you ask me why i did it i cannot answer if you ask me how i am ready to state all that i know concerning the matter but dr zabriskie interposed his friend the why is the most important thing for us to consider just now if you really desire to convince us that you committed the dreadful crime of killing a totally inoffensive man you should give us some reason for an act so opposed to all your instincts and general conduct but the doctor continued unmoved i had no reason for murdering mr hasbrook a hundred questions can elicit no other reply you had better keep to the how a deep-drawn breath from the wife answered the looks of the three gentlemen to whom this suggestion was offered you see that breath seemed to protest that he is not in his right mind i began to waver in my own opinion and yet the intuition which has served me in cases as seemingly impenetrable as this bade me beware of following the general judgment ask him to inform you how he got into the house i whispered to inspector d who sat nearest me immediately the inspector put the question i had suggested by what means did you enter mr hasbrook's house at so late an hour as this murder occurred the blind doctor's head fell forward on his breast and he hesitated for the first and only time you will not believe me said he but the door was ajar when i came to it such things make crime easy it is the only excuse i have to offer for this dreadful deed the front door of a respectable citizen's house ajar at half-past eleven at night it was a statement that fixed in all minds the conviction of the speaker's irresponsibility mrs zabriskie's brow cleared and her beauty became for a moment dazzling as she held out her hands in irrepressible relief towards those who were interrogating her husband i alone kept my impassibility a possible explanation of this crime had flashed like lightning across my mind an explanation from which i inwardly recoiled even while i was forced to consider it dr zabriskie remarked the inspector who was most friendly to him such old servants as those kept by mr hasbrook do not leave the front door ajar at twelve o'clock at night yet ajar it was repeated the blind doctor with quiet emphasis and finding it so i went in when i came out again i closed it do you wish me to swear to what i say if so i am ready what could we reply to see this splendid-looking man hallowed by an affliction so great that in itself it called forth the compassion of the most indifferent accusing himself of a cold-blooded crime 
in tones that sounded dispassionate because of the will that forced their utterance was too painful in itself for us to indulge in any unnecessary words compassion took the place of curiosity and each and all of us turned involuntary looks of pity upon the young wife pressing so eagerly to his side for a blind man ventured one the assault was both deft and certain are you accustomed to mr hasbrook's house that you found your way with so little difficulty to his bedroom i am accustomed he began but here his wife broke in with irrepressible passion he is not accustomed to that house he has never been beyond the first floor why why do you question him do you not see his hand was on her lips hush he commanded you know my skill in moving about a house how i sometimes deceive those who do not know me into believing that i can see by the readiness with which i avoid obstacles and find my way even in strange and untried scenes do not try to make them think i am not in my right mind or you will drive me into the very condition you deprecate his face rigid cold and set looked like that of a mask hers drawn with horror and filled with question that was fast taking the form of doubt bespoke an awful tragedy from which more than one of us recoiled can you shoot a man dead without seeing him asked the superintendent with painful effort give me a pistol and i will show you was the quick reply a low cry came from the wife in a drawer near to every one of us there lay a pistol but no one moved to take it out there was a look in the doctor's eye which made us fear to trust him with a pistol just then we will accept your assurance that you possess a skill beyond that of most men returned the superintendent and beckoning me forward he whispered this is a case for the doctors and not for the police remove him quietly and notify dr southyard of what i say but dr zabriskie who seemed to have an almost supernatural acuteness of hearing gave a violent start at this and spoke up for the first time with real passion in his voice no no i pray you i can bear anything but that remember gentlemen that i am blind that i cannot see who is about me that my life would be a torture if i felt myself surrounded by spies watching to catch some evidence of madness in me rather conviction at once death dishonour and obloquy these i have incurred these i have brought upon myself by crime but not this worse fate oh not this worse fate his passion was so intense and yet so confined within the bounds of decorum that we felt strangely impressed by it only the wife stood transfixed with the dread growing in her heart till her white waxen visage seemed even more terrible to contemplate than his passion distorted one it is not strange that my wife thinks me demented the doctor continued as if afraid of the silence that answered him but it is your business to discriminate and you should know a sane man when you see him inspector d no longer hesitated very well said he give us the least proof that your assertions are true and we will lay your case before the prosecuting attorney proof is not a man's word 
no man's confession is worth much without some evidence to support it in your case there is none you cannot even produce the pistol with which you assert yourself to have committed the deed true true i was frightened by what i had done and the instinct of self-preservation led me to rid myself of the weapon in any way i could but some one found this pistol some one picked it up from the sidewalk of lafayette place on that fatal night advertise for it offer a reward i will give you the money suddenly he appeared to realize how all this sounded alas cried he i know the story seems improbable all i say seems improbable but it is not the probable things that happen in this life but the improbable as you should know who every day dig deep into the heart of human affairs were these the ravings of insanity i began to understand the wife's terror i bought the pistol he went on of alas i cannot tell you his name everything is against me i cannot adduce one proof yet she even she is beginning to fear that my story is true i know it by her silence a silence that yawns between us like a deep and unfathomable gulf but at these words her voice rang out with passionate vehemence no no it is false i will never believe that your hands have been plunged in blood you are my own pure-hearted constant cold perhaps and stern but with no guilt upon your conscience safe in your own wild imagination helen you are no friend to me he declared pushing her gently aside believe me innocent but say nothing to lead these others to doubt my word and she said no more but her looks spoke volumes the result was that he was not detained though he prayed for instant commitment he seemed to dread his own home and the surveillance to which he instinctively knew he would henceforth be subjected to see him shrink from his wife's hand as she strove to lead him from the room was sufficiently painful but the feeling thus aroused was nothing to that with which we observed the keen and agonized expectancy of his look as he turned and listened for the steps of the officer who followed him i shall never again know whether or not i am alone was his final observation as he left our presence i said nothing to my superiors of the thoughts i had had while listening to the above interrogations a theory had presented itself to my mind which explained in some measure the mysteries of the doctor's conduct but i wished for time and opportunity to test its reasonableness before submitting it to their higher judgment and these seemed likely to be given me for the inspectors continued divided in their opinion of the blind physician's guilt and the district attorney when told of the affair pooh-poohed it without mercy and declined to stir in the matter unless some tangible evidence were forthcoming to substantiate the poor doctor's self-accusations if guilty why does he shrink from giving his motives said he and if so anxious to go to the gallows why does he suppress the very facts calculated to send him there he is as mad as a march hare and it is to an asylum he should go and not to jail in this conclusion i failed to agree with him and as time wore on my suspicions took shape and finally ended in a fixed conviction dr zabriskie had committed the crime he avowed but let me proceed a little further with my story before i reveal what lies beyond that but
notwithstanding dr zabriskie's almost frenzied appeal for solitude a man had been placed in surveillance over him in the shape of a young doctor skilled in diseases of the brain this man communicated more or less with the police and one morning i received from him the following extracts from the diary he had been ordered to keep the doctor is settling into a deep melancholy from which he tries to rise at times but with only indifferent success yesterday he wrote around to all his patients for the purpose of withdrawing his services on the plea of illness but he still keeps his office open and to-day i had the opportunity of witnessing his reception and treatment of the many sufferers who came to him for aid i think he was conscious of my presence though an attempt had been made to conceal it for the listening look never left his face from the moment he entered the room and once he rose and passed quickly from wall to wall groping with outstretched hands into every nook and corner and barely escaping contact with the curtain behind which i was hidden but if he suspected my presence he showed no displeasure at it wishing perhaps for a witness to his skill in the treatment of disease and truly i never beheld a finer manifestation of practical insight in cases of a more or less baffling nature than i beheld in him to-day he is certainly a most wonderful physician and i feel bound to record that his mind is as clear for business as if no shadow had fallen upon it dr zabriskie loves his wife but in a way that tortures both himself and her if she is gone from the house he is wretched and yet when she returns he often forbears to speak to her or if he does speak it is with a constraint that hurts her more than his silence i was present when she came in to-day her step which had been eager on the stairway flagged as she approached the room and he naturally noted the change and gave his own interpretation to it his face which had been very pale flushed suddenly and a nervous trembling seized him which he sought in vain to hide but by the time her tall and beautiful figure stood in the doorway he was his usual self again in all but the expression of his eyes which stared straight before him in an agony of longing only to be observed in those who have once seen where have you been helen he asked as contrary to his wont he moved to meet her to my mother's to arnold and constables and to the hospital as you requested was her quick answer made without faltering or embarrassment he stepped still nearer and took her hand and as he did so my physician's eye noted how his finger lay on her pulse in seeming unconsciousness nowhere else he queried she smiled the saddest kind of smile and shook her head then remembering that he could not see this movement she cried in a wistful tone nowhere else constant i was too anxious to get back i expected him to drop her hand at this but he did not and his finger still rested on her pulse and whom did you see while you were gone he continued she told him naming over several names you must have enjoyed yourself was his cold comment as he let go her hand and turned away but his manner showed relief and i could not but sympathize with the pitiable situation of a man 
who found himself forced to means like these for probing the heart of his young wife yet when i turned towards her i realized that her position was but little happier than his tears are no strangers to her eyes but those that welled up at this moment seemed to possess a bitterness that promised but little peace for her future yet she quickly dried them and busied herself with ministrations for his comfort if i am any judge for woman helen zabriskie is superior to most of her sex that her husband mistrusts her is evident but whether this is the result of the stand she has taken in his regard or only a manifestation of dementia i have as yet been unable to determine i dread to leave them alone together and yet when i presume to suggest that she should be on her guard in her interviews with him she smiles very placidly and tells me that nothing would give her greater joy than to see him lift his hand against her for that would argue that he is not accountable for his deeds or for his assertions yet it would be a grief to see her injured by this passionate and unhappy man you have said that you wanted all details i could give so i feel bound to say that dr zabriskie tries to be considerate of his wife though he often fails in the attempt when she offers herself as his guide or assists him with his mail or performs any of the many acts of kindness by which she continually manifests her sense of his affliction he thanks her with courtesy and often with kindness yet i know she would willingly exchange all his set phrases for one fond embrace or impulsive smile of affection that he is not in the full possession of his faculties would be too much to say and yet upon what other hypothesis can we account for the inconsistencies of his conduct i have before me two visions of mental suffering at noon i passed the office door and looking within saw the figure of dr zabriskie seated in his great chair lost in thought or deep in those memories which make an abyss in one's consciousness his hands which were clenched rested upon the arms of his chair and in one of them i detected a woman's glove which i had no difficulty in recognizing as one of the pair worn by his wife that morning he held it as a tiger might hold his prey or a miser his gold but his set features and sightless eyes betrayed that a conflict of emotions was waging with him among which tenderness had but little share though alive as he usually is to every sound he was too absorbed at this moment to notice my presence though i had taken no pains to approach quietly i therefore stood for a full minute watching him till an irresistible sense of the shame of thus spying upon a blind man in his moments of secret anguish seized upon me and i turned away but not before i saw his features relax in a storm of passionate feeling as he rained kisses after kisses on the senseless kid he had so long held in his motionless grasp yet when an hour later he entered the dining-room on his wife's arm there was nothing in his manner to show that he had in any way changed in his attitude towards her the other picture was more tragic still i have no business with mrs zabriskie's affairs but as i passed upstairs to my room an hour ago i caught a fleeting vision of her tall form with the arms thrown up over her head in a paroxysm of feeling which made her as oblivious to my presence as her husband had been several hours before 
were the words that escaped her lips thank god we have no children or was this exclamation suggested to me by the passion and unrestrained impulse of her action End of chapter two part one chapter two part two of the doctor his wife and the clock by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter two part two side by side with these lines i ebenezer gryce placed the following extracts from my own diary watched the zabriskie mansion for five hours this morning from the second-story window of an adjoining hotel saw the doctor when he drove away on his round of visits and saw him when he returned a coloured man accompanied him to-day i followed mrs zabriskie i had a motive for this the nature of which i think it wisest not to divulge she went first to a house in washington place where i am told her mother lives here she stayed some time after which she drove down to kennel street where she did some shopping and later stopped at the hospital into which i took the liberty of following her she seemed to know many there and passed from cot to cot with a smile in which i alone discerned the sadness of a broken heart when she left i left also without having learned anything beyond the fact that mrs zabriskie is one who does her duty in sorrow as in happiness a rare and trustworthy woman i should say and yet her husband does not trust her why i have spent this day in accumulating details in regard to dr and mrs zabriskie's life previous to the death of mr hasbrook i learned from sources it would be unwise to quote just here that mrs zabriskie had not lacked enemies ready to charge her with coquetry that while she had never sacrificed her dignity in public more than one person had been heard to declare that dr zabriskie was fortunate in being blind since the sight of his wife's beauty would have but poorly compensated him for the pain he would have suffered in seeing how that beauty was admired that all gossip is more or less tinged with exaggeration i have no doubt yet when a name is mentioned in connection with such stories there is usually some truth at the bottom of them and a name is mentioned in this case though i do not think it worth my while to repeat it here and loth as i am to recognize the fact it is a name that carries with it doubts that might easily account for the husband's jealousy true i have found no one who dares to hint that she still continues to attract attention or to bestow smiles in any direction save where they legally belong for since a certain memorable night which we all know neither dr zabriskie nor his wife have been seen save in their own domestic circle and it is not into such scenes that this serpent of which i have spoken ever intrudes nor is it in places of sorrow or suffering that his smile shines or his fascinations flourish and so one portion of my theory is proved to be sound dr zabriskie is jealous of his wife whether with good cause or bad i am not prepared to decide 
for her present attitude clouded as it is by the tragedy in which she and her husband are both involved must differ very much from that which she held when her life was unshadowed by doubt and her admirers could be counted by the score i have just found out where harry is as he is in service some miles up the river i shall have to be absent from my post for several hours but i consider the game well worth the candle light at last i have seen harry and by means known only to the police have succeeded in making him talk his story is substantially this that on the night so often mentioned he packed his master's portmanteau at eight o'clock and at ten called a carriage and rode with the doctor to the twenty-ninth street station he was told to buy tickets for Poughkeepsie, where his master had been called in consultation and having done this hurried back to join his master on the platform they had walked together as far as the cars and dr zabriskie was just stepping on to the train when a man pushed himself hurriedly between them and whispered something into his master's ear which caused him to fall back and lose his footing dr zabriskie's body slid half under the car but he was withdrawn before any harm was done though the cars gave a lurch at that moment which must have frightened him exceedingly for his face was white when he rose to his feet and when harry offered to assist him again on to the train he refused to go and said he would return home and not attempt to ride to poughkeepsie that night the gentleman whom harry now saw to be mr stanton an intimate friend of dr zabriskie smiled very queerly at this and taking the doctor's arm led him away to a carriage harry naturally followed them but the doctor hearing his steps turned and bade him in a very peremptory tone to take the omnibus home and then as if on second thought told him to go to poughkeepsie in his stead and explain to the people there that he was too shaken up by his misstep to do his duty and that he would be with them next morning this seemed strange to harry but he had no reason for disobeying his master's orders and so wrote to poughkeepsie but the doctor did not follow him the next day on the contrary he telegraphed for him to return and when he got back dismissed him with a month's wages this ended harry's connection with the zabriskie family a simple story bearing out what the wife had already told us but it furnishes a link which may prove invaluable mr stanton whose first name is theodore knows the real reason why dr zabriskie returned home on the night of the seventeenth of july eighteen fifty one mr stanton consequently i must see and this shall be my business to-morrow checkmate theodore stanton is not in this country though this points him out as the man from whom dr zabriskie bought the pistol it does not facilitate my work which is becoming more and more difficult mr stanton's whereabouts are not even known to his most intimate friends he sailed from this country most unexpectedly on the eighteenth of july a year ago which was the day after the murder of mr hasbrook it looks like a flight especially as he has failed to maintain open communication even with his relatives was he the man who shot mr hasbrook no but he was the man who put the pistol in dr zabriskie's hand that night 
and whether he did this with purpose or not was evidently so alarmed at the catastrophe which followed that he took the first outgoing steamer to europe so far all is clear but there are mysteries yet to be solved which will require my utmost tact what if i seek out the gentleman with whose name that of mrs zabriskie has been linked and see if i can in any way connect him with mr stanton or the events of that night eureka i have discovered that mr stanton cherished a mortal hatred for the gentleman above mentioned it was a covert feeling but no less deadly on that account and while it never led him into any extravagances it was of force sufficient to account for many a secret misfortune which happened to that gentleman now if i can prove he was the mephistopheles who whispered insinuations into the ear of our blind faust i may strike a fact that will lead me out of this maze but how can i approach secrets so delicate without compromising the woman i feel bound to respect if only for the devoted love she manifests for her unhappy husband i shall have to appeal to joe smithers this is something which i always hate to do but as long as he will take money and as long as he is fertile in resources for obtaining the truth from people i am myself unable to reach so long must i make use of his cupidity and his genius he is an honourable fellow in one way and never retails as gossip what he acquires for our use how will he proceed in this case and by what tactics will he gain the very delicate information which we need i own that i am curious to see i shall really have to put down at length the incidents of this night i always knew that joe smithers was invaluable to the police but i really did not know he possessed talents of so high an order he wrote me this morning that he had succeeded in getting mr t s promise to spend the evening with him and advised me that if i desired to be present also his own servant would not be at home and that an opener of bottles would be required as i was very anxious to see mr t with my own eyes i accepted the invitation to play the spy upon a spy and went at the proper hour to mr smithers's rooms which are in the university building i found them picturesque in the extreme piles of books stacked here and there to the ceiling made nooks and corners which could be quite shut off by a couple of old pictures that were set into movable frames that swung out or in at the whim or convenience of the owner as i liked the dark shadows cast by these pictures i pulled them both out and made such other arrangements as appeared likely to facilitate the purpose i had in view then i sat down and waited for the two gentlemen who were expected to come in together they arrived almost immediately whereupon i rose and played my part with all necessary discretion while ridding mr t of his overcoat i stole a look at his face it is not a handsome one but it boasts of a gay devil-may-care expression which doubtless makes it dangerous to many women while his manners are especially attractive and his voice the richest and most persuasive that i have ever heard i contrasted him almost against my will with dr zabriskie and decided that with most women the former's undoubted fascinations of speech and bearing would outweigh the latter's great beauty and mental endowments but i doubted if they would with her 
the conversation which immediately began was brilliant but desultory for mr smithers with an airy lightness for which he is remarkable introduced topic after topic perhaps for the purpose of showing off mr t s versatility and perhaps for the deeper and more sinister purpose of shaking the kaleidoscope of talk so thoroughly that the real topic which we were met to discuss should not make an undue impression on the mind of his guest meanwhile one two three bottles passed and i saw joe smithers's eye grow calmer and that of mr t more brilliant and more uncertain as the last bottle showed signs of failing joe cast me a meaning glance and the real business of the evening began i shall not attempt to relate the half-dozen failures which joe made in endeavouring to elicit the facts we were in search of without arousing the suspicion of his visitor i am only going to relate the successful attempt they had been talking now for some hours and i who had long before been waived from their immediate presence was hiding my curiosity and growing excitement behind one of the pictures when suddenly i heard joe say he has the most remarkable memory i ever met he can tell to a day when any notable event occurred pshaw answered his companion who by the by was known to pride himself upon his own memory for dates i can state where i went and what i did on every day in the year that may not embrace what you call notable events but the memory required is all the more remarkable is it not pooh was his friend's provoking reply you are bluffing ben i will never believe that mr t who had passed by this time into that state of intoxication which makes persistence in an assertion a duty as well as a pleasure threw back his head and as the wreaths of smoke rose in airy spirals from his lips reiterated his statement and offered to submit to any test of his vaunted powers which the other might dictate you have a diary began joe which is at home completed the other will you allow me to refer to it to-morrow if i am suspicious of the accuracy of your recollections undoubtedly returned the other very well then i will wager you a cool fifty that you cannot tell where you were between the hours of ten and eleven on a certain night which i will name done cried the other bringing out his pocket-book and laying it on the table before him joe followed his example and then summoned me write a date down here he commanded pushing a piece of paper towards me with a look keen as the flash of a blade any date man he added as i appeared to hesitate in the embarrassment i thought natural under the circumstances put down day month and year only don't go too far back not farther than two years smiling with the air of a flunkey admitted to the sports of his superiors i wrote a line and laid it before mr smithers who at once pushed it with a careless gesture towards his companion you can of course guess the date i made use of july seventeenth eighteen fifty one mr t who had evidently looked upon this matter as a mere play flushed scarlet as he read these words and for one instant looked as if he had rather flee our presence than answer joe smithers's nonchalant glance of inquiry i have given my word and i will keep it he said at last 
but with a look in my direction that sent me reluctantly back to my retreat i don't suppose you want names he went on that is if anything i have to tell is of a delicate nature oh no answered the other only facts and places i don't think places are necessary either he returned i will tell you what i did and that must serve you i did not promise to give number and street well well joe exclaimed earn your fifty that is all show that you remember where you were in the night off and with an admirable show of indifference he pretended to consult the paper between them the seventeenth of july eighteen fifty one and i shall be satisfied i was at the club for one thing said mr t then i went to see a lady friend where i stayed until eleven she wore a blue muslin what is that i had betrayed myself by a quick movement which sent a glass tumbler crashing to the floor helen zabriskie had worn a blue muslin on that same night i had noted it when i stood on the balcony watching her and her husband that noise it was joe who was speaking you don't know reuben as well as i do or you wouldn't ask it is his practice i am sorry to say to accentuate his pleasure in draining my bottles by dropping a glass at every third one mr t went on she was a married woman and i thought she loved me but and this is the greatest proof i can offer you that i am giving you a true account of that night she had not had the slightest idea of the extent of my passion and only consented to see me at all because she thought poor thing that a word from her would set me straight and rid her of attentions that were fast becoming obnoxious a sorry figure for a fellow to cut who has not been without his triumphs but you caught me on the most detestable date in my calendar and there is where he stopped being interesting so i will not waste time by quoting further and now what reply shall i make when joe smithers asks me double his usual price as you will be sure to do next time has he not earned an advance i really think so i have spent the whole day in weaving together the facts i have gleaned and the suspicions i have formed into a consecutive whole likely to present my theory in a favourable light to my superiors but just as i thought myself in shape to meet their inquiries i received an immediate summons into their presence where i was given a duty to perform of so extraordinary and unexpected a nature that it effectually drove from my mind all my own plans for the elucidation of the zabriskie mystery this was nothing more nor less than to take charge of a party of people who were going to the jersey heights for the purpose of testing dr zabriskie's skill with a pistol End of chapter two part two chapter three part one of the doctor his wife and the clock by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter three part one the cause of this sudden move was soon explained to me mrs zabriskie anxious to have an end put to the present condition of affairs had begged for a more rigid examination into her husband's state this being accorded a strict and impartial inquiry had taken place with a result not unlike that which followed the first one three out of his four interrogators judged him insane and could not be moved from their opinion though opposed by the verdict of the young expert who had been living in the house with him 
dr zabriskie seemed to read their thoughts and showing extreme agitation begged as before for an opportunity to prove his sanity by showing his skill in shooting this time a disposition was evinced to grant his request which mrs zabriskie no sooner perceived than she added her supplications to his that the question might be thus settled a pistol was accordingly brought but at the sight of it her courage failed and she changed her prayer to an entreaty that the experiment should be postponed till the next day and should then take place in the woods away from the sight and hearing of needless spectators though it would have been much wiser to have ended the matter there and then the superintendent was prevailed upon to listen to her entreaties and thus it was that i came to be a spectator if not a participator in the final scene of this most sombre drama there are some events which impress the human mind so deeply that their memory mingles with all after experiences though i have made it a rule to forget as soon as possible the tragic episodes into which i am constantly plunged there is one scene in my life which will not depart at my will and that is the sight which met my eyes from the bow of the small boat in which dr zabriskie and his wife were rowed over to jersey on that memorable afternoon though it was by no means late in the day the sun was already sinking and the bright red glare which filled the heavens and shone full upon the faces of the half-dozen persons before me added much to the tragic nature of the scene though we were far from comprehending its dull significance the doctor sat with his wife in the stern and it was upon their faces my glance was fixed the glare shone luridly on his sightless eyeballs and as i noticed his unwinking lids i realized as never before what it was to be blind in the midst of sunshine her eyes on the contrary were lowered but there was a look of hopeless misery in her colourless face which made her appearance infinitely pathetic and i felt confident that if he could only have seen her he would not have maintained the cold and unresponsive manner which chilled the words on her lips and made all advance on her part impossible on the seat in front of them sat the inspector and a doctor and from some quarter possibly from under the expector's coat there came the monotonous ticking of a small clock which i had been told was to serve as a target for the blind man's aim this ticking was all i heard though the noise and bustle of a great traffic was pressing upon us on every side and i am sure it was all that she heard as with a hand pressed to her heart and eyes fixed on the opposite shore she waited for the event which was to determine whether the man she loved was a criminal or only a being afflicted of god and worthy of her unceasing care and devotion as the sun cast its last scarlet gleam over the water the boat grounded and it fell to my lot to assist mrs zabriskie up the bank as i did so i allowed myself to say i am your friend mrs zabriskie and was astonished to see her tremble and turn toward me with a look like that of a frightened child but there was always this characteristic blending in her countenance of the childlike and the severe such as may so often be seen in the faces of nuns 
and beyond an added pang of pity for this beautiful but afflicted woman i let the moment pass without giving it the weight it perhaps demanded the doctor and his wife had a long talk last night was whispered in my ear as we wound our way along into the woods i turned and perceived at my side the expert physician portions of whose diary i have already quoted he had come by another boat but it did not seem to heal whatever breach lies between them he proceeded then in a quick curious tone he asked do you believe this attempt on his part is likely to prove anything but a farce i believe he will shatter the clock to pieces with his first shot i answered and could say no more for we had already reached the ground which had been selected for this trial at arms and the various members of the party were being placed in their several positions the doctor to whom light and darkness were alike stood with his face towards the western glow and at his side were grouped the inspector and the two physicians on the arm of one of the latter hung dr zabriskie's overcoat which he had taken off as soon as he reached the field mrs zabriskie stood at the other end of the opening near a tall stump upon which it had been decided that the clock should be placed when the moment came for the doctor to show his skill she had been accorded the privilege of setting the clock on this stump and i saw it shining in her hand as she paused for a moment to glance back at the circle of gentlemen who were awaiting her movements the hands of the clock stood at five minutes to five though i scarcely noted the fact at the time for her eyes were on mine and as she passed me she spoke if he is not himself he cannot be trusted watch him carefully and see that he does no mischief to himself or others be at his right hand and stop him if he does not handle his pistol properly i promised and as she passed on setting the clock upon the stump and immediately drawing back to a suitable distance at the right where she stood wrapped in her long dark cloak quite alone her face shone ghastly white even in its environment of snow-covered boughs which surrounded her and noting this i wished the minutes fewer between the present moment and the hour of five at which he was to draw the trigger dr zabriskie quoth the inspector we have endeavoured to make this trial a perfectly fair one you are to have one shot at a small clock which has been placed within a suitable distance and which you are expected to hit guided only by the sound which it will make in striking the hour of five are you satisfied with the arrangement perfectly where is my wife on the other side of the field some ten paces from the stump upon which the clock is fixed he bowed and his face showed satisfaction may i expect the clock to strike soon in less than five minutes was the answer then let me have the pistol i wish to become acquainted with its size and weight we glanced at each other then across at her she made a gesture it was one of acquiescence immediately the inspector placed the weapon in the blind man's hand it was at once apparent that the doctor understood the instrument and my last doubt vanished as to the truth of all he had told us thank god i am blind this hour and cannot see her 
fell unconsciously from his lips then before the echo of these words had left my ears he raised his voice and observed calmly enough considering that he was about to prove himself a criminal in order to save himself from being thought a madman let no one move i must have my ears free for catching the first stroke of the clock and he raised the pistol before him there was a moment of torturing suspense and deep unbroken silence my eyes were on him and so i did not watch the clock but suddenly i was moved by some irresistible impulse to note how mrs zabriskie was bearing herself at this critical moment and casting a hurried glance in her direction i perceived her tall figure swaying from side to side as if under an intolerable strain of feeling her eyes were on the clock the hands of which seemed to creep with snail-like pace along the dial when unexpectedly and a full minute before the minute hand had reached the stroke of five i caught a movement on her part saw the flash of something round and white show for an instant against the darkness of her cloak and was about to shriek a warning to the doctor when the shrill quick stroke of a clock rung out on the frosty air followed by the ping and flash of a pistol a sound of shattered glass followed by a suppressed cry told us that the bullet had struck the mark but before we could move or rid our eyes of the smoke which the wind had blown into our faces there came another sound which made our hair stand on end and sent the blood back in terror to our hearts another clock was striking the clock which we now perceived was still standing upright on the stump where mrs zabriskie had placed it whence came the clock then which had struck before the time and been shattered for its pains one quick look told us on the ground ten paces at the right lay helen zabriskie a broken clock at her side and in her breast a bullet which was fast sapping the life from her sweet eyes we had to tell him there was such pleading in her looks and never shall i forget the scream that rang from his lips as he realized the truth breaking from our midst he rushed forward and fell at her feet as if guided by some supernatural instinct helen he shrieked what is this were not my hands dyed deep enough in blood that you should make me answerable for your life also her eyes were closed but she opened them looking long and steadily at his agonized face she faltered forth it is not you who have killed me it is your crime had you been innocent of mr hasbrook's death your bullet would never have found my heart did you think i could survive the proof that you had killed that good man i-i did it unwittingly i hush she commanded with an awful look which happily he could not see i had another motive i wished to prove to you even at the cost of my life that i loved you had always loved you and not it was now his turn to silence her his hand crept over her lips and his despairing face turned itself blindly towards us go he cried leave us let me take a last farewell of my dying wife without listeners or spectators consulting the eye of the physician who stood beside me and seeing no hope in it 
i fell slowly back the others followed and the doctor was left alone with his wife from the distant position we took we saw her arms creep around his neck saw her head fall confidingly on his breast then silence settled upon them and upon all nature the gathering twilight deepening till the last glow disappeared from the heavens above and from the circle of leafless trees which enclosed this tragedy from the outside world but at last there came a stir and dr zabriskie rising up before us with the dead body of his wife held closely to his breast confronted us with a countenance so rapturous that he looked like a man transfigured i will carry her to the boat said he not another hand shall touch her she was my true wife my true wife and he towered into an attitude of such dignity and passion that for a moment he took on heroic proportions and we forgot that he had just proved himself to have committed a cold-blooded and ghastly crime End of chapter three part one chapter three part two of the doctor his wife and the clock by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline the stars were shining when we again took our seats in the boat and if the scene of our crossing to jersey was impressive what shall be said of that of our return the doctor as before set in the stern an awesome figure upon which the moon shone with a white radiance that seemed to lift his face out of the surrounding darkness and set it like an image of frozen horror before our eyes against his breast he held the form of his dead wife and now and then i saw him stoop as if he were listening for some tokens of life at her set lips then he would lift himself again with hopelessness stamped upon his features only to lean forward in renewed hope that was again destined to disappointment the inspector and the accompanying physician had taken seats in the bow and unto me had been assigned the special duty of watching over the doctor this i did from a low seat in front of him i was therefore so close that i heard his labouring breath and though my heart was full of awe and compassion i could not prevent myself from bending towards him and saying these words dr zabriskie the mystery of your crime is no longer a mystery to me listen and see if i do not understand your temptation and how you a conscientious and god-fearing man came to slay your innocent neighbour a friend of yours or so he called himself had for a long time filled your ears with tales tending to make you suspicious of your wife and jealous of a certain man whom i will not name you knew that your friend had a grudge against this man and so for many months turned a deaf ear to his insinuations but finally some change which you detected in your wife's bearing or in conversation roused your own suspicions and you began to doubt if all was false that came to your ears and to curse your blindness which in a measure rendered you helpless the jealousy fever grew and had risen to a high point when one night a memorable night this friend met you just as you were leaving town and with cruel craft whispered in your ear 
that the man you hated was even then with your wife and if you would return at once to your home you would find him in her company the demon that lurks in the heart of all men good or bad thereupon took complete possession of you and you answered this false friend by saying that you would not return without a pistol whereupon he offered to take you to his house and give you his you consented and getting rid of your servant by sending him to poughkeepsie with your excuses you entered a coach with your friend you said you bought the pistol and perhaps you did but however that may be you left his house with it in your pocket and declining companionship walked home arriving at the colonnade a little before midnight ordinarily you have no difficulty in recognizing your own doorstep but being in a heated frame of mind you walked faster than usual and so passed your own house and stopped at that of mr hasbrook's one door beyond as the entrances of these houses are all alike there was but one way which you could have made yourself sure that you had reached your own dwelling and that was by feeling for the doctor's sign at the side of the door but you never thought of that absorbed in dreams of vengeance your sole impulse was to enter by the quickest means possible taking out your night key you thrust it into the lock it fitted but it took strength to turn it so much strength that the key was twisted and bent by the effort but this incident which would have attracted your attention at another time was lost upon you at this moment an entrance had been effected and you were in too excited a frame of mind to notice at what cost or to detect the small differences apparent in the atmosphere and furnishings of the two houses trifles which would have arrested your attention under other circumstances and made you pause before the upper floor had been reached it was while going up the stairs that you took out your pistol so that by the time you arrived at the front room door you held it ready cocked and drawn in your hand for being blind you feared escape on the part of your victim and so waited for nothing but the sound of a man's voice before firing when therefore the unfortunate mr hasbrook roused by this sudden intrusion advanced with an exclamation of astonishment you pulled the trigger killing him on the spot it must have been immediately upon his fall that you recognized from some word he uttered or from some contact you may have had with your surroundings that you were in the wrong house and had killed the wrong man for you cried out in evident remorse god what have i done and fled without approaching your victim descending the stairs you rushed from the house closing the front door behind you and regaining your own without being seen but here you found yourself baffled in your attempted escape by two things first by the pistol you still held in your hand and secondly by the fact that the key upon which you depended for entering your own door was so twisted out of shape that you knew it would be useless for you to attempt to use it what did you do in this emergency you have already told us though the story seemed so improbable at the time you found nobody to believe it but myself the pistol you flung far away from you down the pavement from which by one of those rare chances which sometimes happen in this world it was presently picked up by some late passer-by of more or less doubtful character the door offered less of an obstacle than you anticipated for when you turned to it again you found it 
if i am not greatly mistaken ajar left so as we have reason to believe by one who had gone out of it but a few minutes before in a state which left him but little master of his actions it was this fact which provided you with an answer when you were asked how you succeeded in getting into mr hasbrook's house after the family had retired for the night astonished at the coincidence but hailing with gladness the deliverance which it offered you went in and ascended at once into your wife's presence and it was from her lips and not from those of mrs hasbrook that the cry arose which startled the neighbourhood and prepared men's minds for the tragic words which were shouted a moment later from the next house but she who uttered the scream knew of no tragedy save that which was taking place in her own breast she had just repulsed a dastardly suitor and seeing you enter so unexpectedly in a state of unaccountable horror and agitation was naturally stricken with dismay and thought she saw your ghost or what was worse a possible avenger while you having failed to kill the man you sought and having killed a man you esteemed let no surprise on her part lure you into any dangerous self-betrayal you strove instead to soothe her and even attempted to explain the excitement under which you laboured by an account of your narrow escape at the station till the sudden alarm from next door distracted her attention and sent both your thoughts and hers in a different direction not till conscience had fully awakened and the horror of your act had had time to tell upon your sensitive nature did you breathe forth those vague confessions which not being supported by the only explanations which would have made them credible led her as well as the police to consider you affected in your mind your pride as a man and your consideration for her as a woman kept you silent but did not keep the worm from preying upon your heart am i not correct in my surmises dr zabriskie and is not this the true explanation of your crime with a strange look he lifted up his face hush said he you will awaken her see how peacefully she sleeps i should not like to have her awakened now she is so tired and i i have not watched over her as i should appalled at his gesture his look his tone i drew back and for a few minutes no sound was to be heard but the steady dip dip of the oars and the lap lap of the waters against the boat then there came a quick uprising the swaying before me of something dark and tall and threatening and before i could speak or move or even stretch forth my hands to stay him the seat before me was empty and darkness had filled the place where but an instant previous he had sat a fearsome figure erect and rigid as a sphinx what little moonlight there was only served to show us a few rising bubbles marking the spot where the unfortunate man had sunk with his much-loved burden we could not save him as the widening circles fled farther and farther out the tide drifted us away and we lost the spot which had seen the termination of one of earth's saddest tragedies the bodies were never recovered 
the police reserved to themselves the right of withholding from the public the real facts which made this catastrophe an awful remembrance to those who witnessed it a verdict of accidental death by drowning answered all purposes and saved the memory of the unfortunate pair from such calumny as might have otherwise assailed it it was the least we could do for two beings whom circumstances had so greatly afflicted the end end of chapter three part two end of the doctor his wife and the clock by anna catherine green recorded by carolyn in groningen in the netherlands on a weekend in january two thousand fourteen thank you for listening